yogurt and underneath the lid it said, please try again. They were having a contest I was unaware of, but I thought I might have opened the yogurt wrong. Or maybe your play was trying to inspire me. Come on, Mitch, don't give up. Please try again. A message of inspiration from your friends at Yo Play. Fruit on the bottom, hope on top. I used to do drugs. I still do, but I used to too. <laughs> this is comedy journalist Julie Seaball. Welcome to Hope on Top, a Mitch Hedberg oral history. Born February 24, 1968 in St. Paul, Minnesota, Mitch Hedberg was a stand-up star on the rise through the late 90s and early aughts. His quirky, whimsical material favored one-liners about animals, food, and personal grooming. Long-haired and downward-gazing, his onstage presence proved universally endearing. Hedberg began performing in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, before spending time in Seattle, San Francisco, New York, and Los Angeles. He won 1997's Seattle Comedy Competition, was cited as the next Seinfeld by Time Magazine after a 1998 appearance at Montreal's annual Just for Laughs Comedy Festival, and his independent film Los Enchiladas premiered at Sundance in 1999. In 2003 and early 2004, he opened for Dave Attell and Louis Black on a massive Comedy Central Live tour, and in late 2004 co-headlined theaters with Stephen Lynch. He performed 10 times on The Late Show with David Letterman and appeared on That 70s Show, the film Lords of Dogtown, and in the background, smoking fake pot with the real Peter Frampton of Almost Famous. On March 30th, 2005, five weeks after his 37th birthday, Hedberg was discovered dead in a Livingston, New Jersey hotel room by his wife, Lynn Shawcroft. A medical examiner's report concluded accidental drug overdose as the cause. In the 15 years since his passing, Hedberg's material has been embraced by new generations of comedy fans who discover his timeless one-liners through YouTube and effortless memes. Posthumous release Do You Believe in Gosh joined Comedy Central Records albums, Strategic Girl Locations, and Mitch All Together in a 2016 vinyl box set. His legacy includes an uncompromising dedication to the art form, commemorated here through comedy industry members and performers like Attell, Tom Rhodes, and Doug Stanhope. My name is Tom Rhodes, and I met Mitch Hedberg in 1993. I had been doing stuff for Comedy Central, and I had done cable television shows, and I was like the long-haired guy. And I was headlining at the Comedy Underground in Seattle. And after the show, Mitch's then girlfriend, Jenna, came up to me and said, uh, my boyfriend's a big fan. He looks up to you. Would you mind? He's kind of shy. Would you mind coming over? And I met him and he just had this adorable shyness about him. Like he could barely keep eye contact and it was really lovable. Uh, we had drinks afterwards, talked about comedy. You know, he was asking me. You know, like, uh, you know, how do you get in with this place? And what's the, you know, what's the procedure with getting on Comedy Central? There's just normal, typical things that, you know, um, young comedians ask each other when they're trying to figure out the puzzle of showbiz. My name is uh, is Jeff Wills, and I uh, I was a comedy club booker. And I booked clubs in primarily on the West Coast. In fact, all on the West Coast, um, including the Comedy Underground in Seattle and the punchline in San Francisco. I want to say the first time I booked Mitch was in some one-nighters. I think we would pay a buck fifty to the headliner and either 75 or or $100 to the opener to play in Missoula, Montana, to play in Moscow, Idaho, to play in Clarkston, Lewiston, you know, these, these what turned out to be diabolical one-nighters. I would just make them go. And the opener's job was to drive the headliner. And that's how I think I first met Mitch or first knew of him. Because it was a warm body tour. You, it wasn't like you were booking premium acts necessarily. You were just booking acts that would go. You know, you just to, to go. One of the acts willing to go just to go throughout the 90s was Doug Stanhope, who instantly bonded with his fellow road warrior from the onset. 
I remember uh, the first time I met Hedberg was at the Mall of America in Minneapolis. And I think I was doing two weeks and it was the second week. Lewis Johnson from Denver was the headliner. And to me, he's funny, but he was like an old, bitter guy. He was probably 32. <laughs> and he's a, he was very funny. But the fact that Lewis Johnson pulled me aside going, have you seen this guy before? Man, I just work with this guy. He is fucking funny. And when another comic, especially a bitter, what you consider at that age, a road dog, like tired guy tells you another comedian is funny. Hedberg was opening MC work. And it is not Hedberg's strong suit is, hey, are there any birthday parties here tonight? (laughs) So he was going up with, again, most people weren't getting it, but. Me and Lewis Johnson were in the back fucking dying at like just this early, you know, nebulous stage of Hedberg. And Hedberg and I just tore up a Hampton Inn doing fucking LSD and just laughing our balls off, just goofing on everything, just uh, trying to creep in like we were military people on a mission to get downstairs at daybreak for the free Hampton Inn lobby breakfast and just trying to creep down to get a waffle undetected because we were sure we are tripping so hard everyone will know we're tripping. It made no sense. But, you know, when you're a kid, we, yeah, we bonded immediately. And uh, anyone who's done hallucinogens with what you would consider a stranger but us in the trenches on the road no that's my new best friend and we we stayed that way for quite a while Hedberg and I both lived on the road he was from Minneapolis but he started in Florida I definitely lived on the road and so did he so we had a common bond in that and he had the girlfriend Jana Johnson who is so wonderful we didn't talk a lot about comedy, which was weird in the, those days. Like Tripper talk about deeper things. Like he had such deeper insights than I was ever aware of. He was the one guy they go, oh, fuck, this guy's way smarter than me. But I think he was playing for us, you know, at the Comedy Underground in Seattle, which is a small, very cool, was, it's, it's moved since then, but it was, you know, downstairs, basement type of, of club. And uh, he was working there for us. And then he was like, I want to come to San Francisco. I don't believe he had an agent. Uh, he would just call. And we started to book him at our clubs. You know, one in Sacramento, excuse me, uh, Walnut Creek, which is demised. And we had the punchline in San Francisco. And he started coming through there. I saw him the next time in San Francisco. I was living in San Francisco at the time. And he had moved to Pacifica which is like an hour south of San Francisco. I don't know anybody would move there, but it's a really lovely, cool place. And uh, I saw him do a set in San Francisco and uh, his jokes were great. He he was a little uh, awkward with the shyness. And uh, I remember um, feeling like, you know, um, uh, why, <laughs> why aren't you more confident on stage? I remember him as an MC, you know, the standard headliner, middle MC thing, and he was terrible at it. Because you imagine, you got to have someone who's getting the crowd going, they're just in, and there'd be just Mitch, you know, holding the microphone, kind of looking down and doing his stuff. And even in San Francisco, where it's, you know, supposed to be this comedy, you know, adoring town, it, it could be a little bit rough for a while. But he persisted. And, you know, I think... We, we figured out real quickly that he should be a middle act at the very least. He didn't have any credits or anything like that, which was a big deal back then. It was never really truly based on how good your comedy was. It was credits that sell tickets, that, that, that sort of mentality that I worked under and thought was the right way to do it. But we knew to put him as a, as a middle act, and he started to excel in that, in that spot. where. Someone else took the hit, opening the crowd up, and it's a sweet spot. Well, he was highly lovable, and San Francisco is a very forgiving place, and it wasn't shortly thereafter that I saw him absolutely destroying. And when he caught fire, it was like, I never saw him do a bad set after that. 
even if he was like super wasted, you know, it was still lovable. And the people were I've, very rarely have I ever seen the enthusiasm audiences have um, that they had for Hedberg. I'm David Tell. I guess my big first meeting with Mitch was he opened for me at the uh, San Francisco Punchline. And, um, you know, he was definitely he was definitely the strongest act where pretty much every show I was like, oh, man, I don't know if I can follow this guy. You would watch him on stage and you would immediately go, I have to write more jokes. I have to write more jokes. This guy is a joke machine. Every joke is almost perfect and he basically blew me off the stage he was great the fun of it was when it didn't work and you would see him kind of like recover and the way mitch would do it he would go like oh that one is not so good you know oh man i don't know i better i don't know how that one got out the way he would do it you kind of feel like you're pulling for him the whole time you know that was the that was the cool of it also is that like he really was like the kind of guy the character who he was was just a sweet guy, you know, like this sweet kind of like innocent, almost like a idiot savant type, you know, it's like otherworldly quality to him. But he turned that into his strongest asset, I think. And his lovableness and his shyness on stage, I really think uh, the endur enduring quality and beauty of Mitch Hedberg's style is that he really ca captured the essence of himself, which he really had this genuine innocence and shyness about him and that was uh kind of where these beautiful cartoonish joke ideas came from and uh the persona was what it was where it was basically eyes closed and you know kind of like um uh, a low a low talking but with a cadence to it where it seemed like he was pretty much um you know in his own in his own world i guess you could say like in his own thing he had fun with it. I mean, he's just the same old Mitch. I mean, he was probably the least arrogant person I've ever known in entertainment. You know, he really had a genuine sweet soul. You know, when you would go to San Francisco, especially Jeff Wills and like all the people who still lived up there at the time, everybody worked at the club. It was like, oh, this is going to be great. Oh, my God, it's going to be like so much partying. It's going to be so hard, but it's going to be great. And like we we had the best of times there and we also had some of the best shows there and the crowds this is before any kind of i think political correctness you know really kind of affected comedy where almost at that point it was like who could be dirtier who could be hardier who could be edgier and the crowd also would bring bring their a game in terms of heckling and all that kind of stuff and then hedberg would get up there and he was so different than the rest of us he was not an east coast comic he was not like a you know you know, gun and run kind of guy with the crowd. He basically stood his ground. He had timing. He had these amazing jokes. And the crowd would come closer. And they totally connected with it. We were coming out of Sacramento. And um, the whole idea was we, we were driving from Sacramento to San Francisco, the one-two punch of, of clubs. And we knew everybody in both clubs. And, like, we both were like, this is cool. Like, we're going to get a ride from some of the staff. So we all get in the car. And... Um, Mitch, who's, who's like uh, way ahead of the curve on the hallucinogenics. So evidently, they all got mushrooms or ecstasy or something, and they're driving on this through sack to the thing. So I'm going like, not only are we going to crash, but I'm going to be like the designated guy who will feel the crash because everybody else is so high. I must have offered like a hundred times, do you mind if I drive or could I drive? But uh, it was just so funny that like, you know, everybody's having the best time, you know, like, whoa, I didn't know they had rice fields here in Sacramento. And, you know, really, they shot MASH somewhere, you know, like everybody's same dumb California stuff. But I'm like, just going like, oh, my God, I can't believe this is you know happening. But it was it was it was just fun to see, like, you know, I guess this it, I missed the summer of love, but that was the drive of love. <laughs> acid was my favorite drug because acid don't butter my mind. Because of acid, I now know that butter is way better than margarine. I saw through the bullshit. When I was on acid, I would see things like beams of light, and I'd hear sounds that sounded an awful lot like car horns. When we were on acid, we were going to the woods because when you're in the woods tripping, there's less likely a chance you run into an authority figure. But we ran into a bear. That was even more of a buzz kill. My friend Dwayne was standing there raising his right hand, swearing to help prevent forest fires. 
We got away from the bed, put his arm around my shoulder. He said, Mitchell, Smokey is way more intense in person. He's an asshole. Hedberg, uh, at some point early on, uh, mid-90s, got uh, hired to open for Bill Maher. And he got fired for drinking wine out of a paper bag on stage. But, uh, yeah, he got fired for being unprofessional. Bill Maher said that was unprofessional to drink wine out of a... Do you fucking know who you're hiring? It's fucking Hedberg, man. And then I remember it was at the, I want to say it's the Warfield Theater, and Ellen was touring. She'd gotten big enough to tour theaters, and Mitch was opening. I'm like, holy cow, you know, he's doing it. We did the Ellen tour. But back then, it was just like, you're buying Ellen DeGeneres. He didn't know who was coming in support. And I remember thinking that was sort of an odd choice. Hi, this is Todd Barry. My first experience with Mitch Hedberg was he opened for Ellen DeGeneres, and my manager... Uh, I guess was interested in Mitch at the time and, uh, and I guess ended up managing him. But so I went to watch Mitch Hedberg pre massive fame open for Ellen DeGeneres, which was not necessarily his uh, target demographic, but he went out there and he just sauntered out there and he had this crazy long hair, like much longer than he did uh, more recently. And then uh, he just hung in there. I think it might've been a town hall. I don't remember where it was, but I do remember it being just an odd energy, but he, he definitely, he stuck to it and, and cracked them. So we get a little bit bigger. We get to co-headline Surrey, BC. Surrey is a, uh, the outskirts of Vancouver and it's the comedy cave. Canada's a motherfucker. Like if you have a DUI on your record, you cannot get into Canada. Like they're pricks. So, Hedberg is honest when he fills out the paperwork to get a visa and says, yeah, he does have an arrest for steal stealing petty theft. When he was a kid, when he was 17, him and his friends saw a, a, a tractor trailer that had not locked their load. So they went in and stole what turned out to be boxes of Tupperware. So he's honest in his application, and he puts that in, and then all oh, red flags go up. He has to get what's called a minister's permit, where you have to beg forgiveness, like it's the fucking king of Thailand about to lop off your head, and you pay. He paid, like, I think we were getting paid $400 for the weekend, and he had to pay three fifty dollars to get the minister's permit. It's what you did back in those days paying your dues so but i remember he didn't give a fuck about the money but he did go on stage and he told this story in a very you know truncated headberg way about stealing tupperware and having to get a minister's permit and he goes man you guys take leftovers way too seriously and you know, that made it worth it you just won back your 350 son this is a VHS day, so he would film all this stupid doing acid in Montana, and he would edit them. Back when you, I don't know, maybe he had to cut the actual fucking VHS tape. I don't know how he did it, but he was a magician, and he would spend endless hours putting these tapes together. So, yeah, there's, there's footage of us playing tennis. So part of that the video that he finally sent me, and it was called This with an exclamation. And uh, in it, we're backstage at that Surrey, B.C., Canada gig. Hedberg and I, there was a lot of uh, homoeroticism back before. It was a different day and age where you just you could shock value. So we would make out in front of people quite a bit and get naked in front of people. But we would do that shit all the time. And in this video, in Surrey, B.C., we're in the kitchen and we, hey, you want to make out in front of the cooks? Yes. <laughs> and so he, he filmed us making out and then in the video slows it up and is playing a foreigner. I want to know what love is over a slow motion, us just making out with tongues in front of horrified kitchen staff. We did the San Francisco comedy competition. That was 95. 
And it's a three-week-long competition. So the first week, there's 20 participants, and you get graded on a nightly basis. So as the week goes on, it's more and more clear who the front runners are. And when he was mathematically eliminated from winning, and he was clearly the best comic there, but he just was not getting judged. This There weren't comics or... There's like morning show DJs that are, uh, or a writer for the fucking weekly, like some position, lowly position of, you don't know comedy. So when he was mathematically eliminated, instead of dropping out like anyone else and going home, he'd do his show, but you got a light at your seven minute mark to let you know that if you go and at that point he would just drop the mic when that light went on he would just drop the mic and leave mid sentence man people say don't you get tired of not having any friends and I said click <laughs> like he's just right in the middle of a fucking joke he just walk off stage but he did his time he was a man of, of, of principle that character I'm sorry I'm here with uh, Greg Chaley we were all intertwined at one point. I first met Hedberg in 95. I started booking a comedy show at Chilkoot Charlie's in Anchorage, Alaska. But it is not a place that you would want to put comedy because it's a pretty roughneck bar. We had a lot of people yelling at the comics, standing up and wanting to take it outside sometimes. So all the comics that we did have up there, their experience was they wanted to go to Alaska. And that's how we got them. And I know Mitch loved to travel, and uh, being at Coots was an experience. I think with Hedberg, he really kind of got what he did really early, and then the rest of it was just gravy. Like, you know, now I can really explore the thoughts in my mind. That Like, I know who I am on stage, and it usually takes years and years to figure that out. He figured it out pretty much right away. He knew who he was, and he wrote it out, and it was just great to see people like that. Because for me, early in comedy, it was like a lot of like, you know, I don't feel comfortable, I'm not good at this. Uh, you know, I'm bombing pretty much all the time and that, you know, my kind of comedy is the reflection of going on late and kind of fighting a crowd and like that kind of thing. Whereas Mitch, you know, he basically zenned his way through it. Hedberg, he got to L.A. before me. I don't know how, not long before me, matter of months, no more than a year. But he was set up there with Jana and uh, that's when... I finally got some money from that competition and the HBO deal, and I, oh, I'm moving to L.A. So he said, yeah, you can crash with me till you get a place, which I did not like other comics capitalize on that and try to homestead the fucking place. Sierra Bonita, that was the street. I just remembered something. Mitch and Jana and I had gone to the Whiskey to go see Space Hog, the band Space Hog, and I remember Mitch going like, when they go on, let's pretend like we're six, like the like Beatles girls, right? We're, and, and there were a lot of people there. It really was kind of embarrassing, but I had to do it because he was doing it and we were just like clutching our chests and like screaming. And it's like these fucking British guys were like, what the fuck are these idiots? So uh, yeah, Mitch and I would uh, continue our... Uh Tennis exploits at Plummer Park, where the Russians hang out next to the gays, but never both, never Russian and gay, one or the other. And then we always walked past this bar, the Coaching Horses, when we were walking up Sunset, and it was like a scary day drinking bar. Like, people really drink in a place like that? Now I know better. That's the first place you go, but because of that, I know better. Coaching Horses... We finally dared each other to go and day drink in there. This ginger was the bartender. What? What do you want? This isn't a bus stop. And then we got in their good graces, and then we just kept day drinking there all the time. And then, so that's where Tarantino came in once to day drink. You know, like, oh my God, it's Quentin Tarantino, man. Hey man, you want a you want a shot of Jägermeister? All right, <laughs> we're doing Jägermeister with Quentin Tarantino. When I moved to LA, I thought I had to do what my boss said, meaning uh, now I have an Im uh, now I have an agent and a manager, so I have to do what they tell me to do. It's not just stand up. Now I'm doing auditions for shitty commercials. 
I get an audition for, and I swear it, it has to be Dude, Where's My Car? But if it's not that, it was something that innate garbage. And I'm reading the lines that I have to do an audition for the next day, going, this is the most embarrassing dialogue. And Hedberg and I go to the Coach and Horses that night, and I'm reading this shit to him. And I, I'm going beat red in embarrassment, just saying it to my friend, much less the idea of having to stand in front of you know casting directors and say this like I mean it as a... I, I'm, I'm right now just repeating it. I'm getting queasy. And Hedberg and I just, we got progressively drunker and goofing on the script. And at some point, Hedberg says, man, why don't you just say no? And it was this, I had never considered the idea that I could just say no to a part. I'm supposed to be here because you, you suits gave me an opportunity to be big time. Yeah, man, just say no. Like, fuck. And I was just like uh, released. It was, I, I felt like a, uh, uh, the guy in the green mile where he breathes out fucking bees. Just the weight that was lifted off of me. We go to a restaurant on the weekends, it's busy, so they start a waiting list. They start calling out names. They say, Dufresne, party of two. Table ready for Dufresne, party of two. And if no one answers, they'll say the name again. Dufresne, party of two. But then if no one answers, they'll just go right on to the next name. Bush, party of three. Yeah, what happened to the Dufresne? No one seems to give a shit. Who can eat at a time like this? People are missing. You fuckers are selfish. <laughs> the Dufresne's are in someone's trunk right now with duct tape over their mouth. And they're hungry. That's a double whammy. We need hell. Bush, search party of three. Mitch came back up to Anchorage and he wasn't there to perform. He was there to film international partiers. He filmed the first part of it down in Mexico with his friends Bush and uh, Dufresne. And people recognized those names because they were incorporated in a joke. But these were two guys, and they were guys that he grew up with. So he flew them up to Anchorage, and I was working promotions at that at the bar. Chilkoot Charlie's up there. And um, I had access to a lot of things up there, which was what he wanted. He wanted to send these guys out. I was working at a radio station part-time and I was also still with the club and I got them to judge a some kind of a wet t-shirt contest at Hooters uh they went in and did a dance contest at, at a place called Hot Rods which is just like old grizzled people in a basement and I think they got kicked out of that and then uh I gave them platinum cards so they could go in and out of chill coots and this was all part of him introducing the world to the international partiers and they just were, were very ill received <laughs> everywhere they went and uh mitch was filming the whole thing these two friends of his bush and dufresne and the, he was trying to celebrate them as they're the biggest party animals and that i remember they had like oh they flip off the camera when you take a picture <laughs> He just had him doing goofy shit, but he presented them as though they're like Bert Kreischer actually became, you know, Playboy magazine's biggest college partier. He was presenting before that ever happened. These guys and they're just dullards. <laughs> they're, they're, they, they were not partiers at all. That was the thing is they would come back with all these tales of, of huge bottomless margaritas and all these fine ladies that they were nuzzling up against. But when we brought them out on the ice to do drop the puck for the anchor aces and they were announced, no one gave a shit, but they were, they were announced with such like, like gusto. Like, can you believe it? The international partiers are here and Mitch is loving It's exactly what he wanted. Was it, it just fell flat everywhere. He wouldn't abandon ship if the joke fell flat. Cause that's what he's expecting. And it made him giggle. I remember uh, uh, Chris Huggy Bear Hughes was an open micer and his mother opened a bar on the west side of Phoenix when Hedberg and I were already in L.A. later 
on. And he's like, hey, will you guys come out? And we drove out from L.A. to play his mother's bar. And it was just this slipshod, miscreant convention, like Star Wars bar of every trees lounge, broken VFW type of seahorse posture, angry fucking pustules on the nose type of people just staring into their drinks. And the show was that. Hey, say something funny. Looking back into their drinks, and afterwards, we're just sitting there because we know the son, the golden child of the bar, and his mother serving drinks. And Hedberg and I just took off our fucking pants, balls fucking naked, <laughs> sitting on bar stools, and we got pictures taken. And I lost the roll of film, and to this day. 20 several years later I fucking I fucking lost that role of film yeah I mean he had the be- you know of perfect uh, act for television also I think if you just have like individual jokes that aren't rants and you just fucking lo- you just lay the joke out wait for the applause and then lay another one out it's, it's kind of uh, I know and I know Letterman really loved him my name is Zoe Friedman I was a a booker on the David Letterman show, Late Night with David Letterman. I booked the comics from 1996 to 2000. Dave was very Midwestern, no sex, no drugs. It really limited and and forced the comedians to be clean, but not maybe middle of the road, you know, and finding that comic that worked for him. So when I saw Mitch and how sort of unique his tone and pacing and sort of the absurdist view of life, which I love, it worked on a lot of levels. The booker was a gal, uh, Zoe Friedman, and she loved Mitch. And Mitch was her first get for for Letterman to be on, on the air. So it was a big deal for her, too. And she was great. The clothing was such a big deal, right? Dave wanted the comics to be in suits. That was like what he wore on The Tonight Show. That's kind of what he wanted. Dave Becky had to buy, his manager had to buy him pants that he was allowed to wear on Letterman. Letterman did not allow jeans. So we, we ended up going to, down in Times Square or something, a diesel, some high-end fancy thing. And I, he, had, he bought a pair of black diesel jeans but they were fancy enough that they didn't look like Levi's, I guess. And that was a that was a kind of a big deal. To He didn't know why he had to pay $100 for a pair. I mean, Dave Becky paid for it, but it, it was one of those things. Maybe my worried look was what made them run out of Times Square to get stuff, but I don't remember. But it was a Thursday taping, so he was the second taping on Thursday. So that was going to air on Friday. So I was in the green room. And I had my video recorder, so I, without asking any permission, I just videotaped the monitor of Mitch's set while he was doing it. Mitch was definitely the guy who I saw crush Letterman. He had the best set I've ever seen on that show, and uh, it took years and years and years for me to see one that it was even close to what he did. His first appearance when he was going all guns at it, it really, honestly, I was watching it on a TV, but I felt like I was there. We ended up staying in the Letterman Hotel for a couple of days. <laughs> and I, I remember, we're, like, we just bummed around Times Square, went to go see a movie, eat some pizza. I mean, it, it just hanging out. And then uh, they finally said we had to leave. We did so well that the show had him back a lot, which was the goal of all goals. The ultimate thing to do was to be on The Letterman Show and then to be asked back again and again and again. They had a lot of things you're allowed to talk about, not allowed. Censors, you know, all that kind of stuff. Network, um, whatever it was, standards and practices. But like for Mitch, he could just roll out there and like do his stuff, you know. And it was really cool to see how it worked so well in a small, small seven minute, you know, window in front of a live TV crowd. And, uh, you know, that, that, that to me is still the template of what a great TV set looks like. He really got to see the power of that on Letterman, where he didn't have to edit a word. So when Mitch was on the show for the first time, I think it was 97, uh, and he came back soon, like six months after that, he was a friend of the show. JFL, that's where I, like, uh, Stan Hope, Hedberg for sure, and a bunch of other names. That's where we all would 
you know, it was kind of like the Olympics of drinking. You know, we would go there and like go nuts and have a great time. I did Montreal with Mitch in 98. And we flew up on the fl same plane together. And Mitch had a bag of cocaine and we're sitting next to him. And he's like slipping into the bathroom. And so like Montreal in 1998, I was really nervous because like, I had been the bell of the ball of Montreal in 95, which, you know, led to my deal with NBC. And uh, I felt like, I don't know, it was weird. Like, I remember we were in Montreal and he's like slipping me like his bag of cocaine to go do it. And I remember like being nervous, like, oh, my God, if someone from Comedy Central finds out that I did cocaine. I don't know why I felt like showbiz was like high school or whatever. And Mitch was completely unconcerned what anyone thought. And he absolutely destroyed Montreal that year. And he was the bell of the ball and um, got his big deal with, I think, Fox from that. I was there. I think I was just crashing that year, but I you always end up getting sets. But that was the year Hedberg was just destroyed the festival, got a half million dollar development deal. And I was trying to do shenanigans and fuck off. And he's like, oh, man, I can't do that. I just got a lot of money. So in 98, he got uh, this big deal. I'm not sure if I was at the at the festival that time, but that was the big talk that he got this deal. And everybody was getting these deals. You know, that was the whole thing. You go to JFL and you get a deal and all that kind of stuff. And um, he got the deal. And then I'm not I'm pretty sure it didn't work out. <laughs> and then that's where he got that great joke of like, you know, you know, comedy is the only thing where, like, the better you get at it, the more they want you to do something else. You know, it's like they want, they're like, you're a great comic, but can you act? So as a comedian, I always get these situations where I'm auditioning for movies and sitcoms, you know. As a comedian, they want you to do other things besides comedy. They say, all right, you're a comedian. Can you write? Write us a script. Act. Act in this sitcom. They want me to do shit that's related to comedy, but it's not comedy, man. It's not fair, you know. It's as though if I was a cook and I worked my ass off to become a really good cook. I said, all right, you're a cook. Can you farm? <laughs> well, one of the things that happened in 1998 in Montreal is Mitch was good friends with and played at the Laugh Stop in Houston. And the Laugh Stop in Houston uh, was run by Mark Babbitt and the guy had exquisite taste in comedy. Mitch introduced me to Mark Babbitt and told me I would love the club and we both took less money so we could work together and we co-headlined it together I think four times and it was like Led Zeppelin hitting Houston and I have to say Houston, Texas has got some of the purest cocaine available in America today. It's, uh, I mean, they really have a respect for the original product. They don't step on it too hard and, uh, you know, the laugh stop would put you at the Allen Park Inn, which no longer exists, which is, was on the Allen Park Parkway. And um, it was this massive old hotel built in like the 60s. It was like, it looked like a place where like astronauts would have affairs, like 1964 or something, you know? So it was this massive property. And we would always stay on the back of the property because, uh, you know, it's probably a thousand rooms and maybe they had 50 rooms you know, sold that night. And there was never anybody on the back. And there was a pool on the backside of the property with this massive lawn. And it was really fun back then because all the local Houston comedians were great people. Everybody was really into comedy. And Mitch had brought me there. He didn't have to do me that favor, but he did. And that's, you know, uh, it, it was a beautiful gift. And those are probably some of the greatest memories of my career. I mean, that club was like one of the most perfectly designed comedy clubs ever in America. And it was always packed. And Mitch and I would destroy the place. And we would, we would go headline and, you know, flip flop. And I, uh, you know, it was, it, it was difficult uh, to go on after the man uh, sometimes. But we would invite all the comedians back to our hotel. And you could play music loud and you could run around. And uh, that was the first time I learned that it's Texas state law that if you have the do not disturb sign on your hotel room for three days, they have to check if you're dead. And I learned that playing with uh, Mitch, you know, we're just doing tons of coke and partying and um, never had made service. And there was one night we had invited, you know, we'd invite people from that were in the audience back. We'd have these great parties. And uh, doors open and music playing. And we had done mushrooms once. And it was in Houston and it's hot. 
And the sprinklers came on this back lawn. And me and Mitch took off our clothes and we're just running around like, you know, um, homoerotic nymphs, you know, and just jumping through the sprinklers. And then we'd run and we'd dive into the pool. And like, there's no one there to say no, you know, there's probably one security guard and who knows where he was. And we just run through the sprinklers and dive into the pool. And there's like 30 people, the local Houston comedians and some of the people who had watched us do this show earlier. And I, Ralphie may heard me tell this story once. And Ralphie goes, I was there. I did that with you. I took off my clothes and I ran through those sprinklers. No, he didn't. Everyone would have remembered a naked Ralphie may. Um, but no, it was just me and Mitch running through these sprinklers and it was probably one of my favorite memories ever. And then there was a secondary thing where, uh, there was, I forget these two guys that were whatever production company, they were talking about Mitch and I doing a animated show together because they thought that both of our, um, jokes had, you know, kind of whatever cartoonish aspects that could be animated and um you know at the time i had absolutely nothing going on in show business so like this really meant a lot to me <laughs> and we did a couple of um um conference calls together and i remember one of these guys said something uh hedberg didn't like like hedberg he offered up an idea and the guy on the phone shot it down and Hedberg goes, uh, well, fuck you guys. I don't, I'm going to be famous without you. And he like hung up the phone and that was the end of, uh, <laughs> whatever I had going on in 1998. That was Mitch. He's almost like a rock star type of vibe about him. You know, you know, when he got all that money from, I think it was Fox, he got like 500 grand out of that Montreal comedy festival. And I want to say he moved directly to the Chelsea Hotel. Uh, he just fucking rented a room, and or I don't know what they look like there, and and just got into that super bohemian lifestyle. But it was, I think it was after that, the next spring, where we did the Chicago Comedy Festival. So Chicago, we walked in cocky, and who gives a fuck about this festival? Because. He's not going to get another half a million dollars eight months later. So I just followed his I don't give a fuck lead. And that's when we knew how festivals worked. And the, there's the, it, it's kind of a pattern where someone is the, the buzz of the festival. And everyone talks about what he had just gone through. He was the buzz of Montreal. And he, so we tried to uh, create that same buzz about someone else just randomly. So we picked DT Tosh out of the Chicago Comedy Festival. New faces, new guys, no one knows. So we just randomly picked him. And then every time we were in an elevator with some suits and, uh, you know, industry people that we knew, agents, and we just fight with each other. Yeah, who's this fucking Dan Tosh guy that everyone's talking about him? The guy is, what's he been doing comedy three years and now all of a sudden everyone wants to sign him? Because fucking agents don't know. They have no idea. They just sit there blindly and, oh, whoa, where's the feeding frenzy? I want in. I have a blank checkbook from the fucking office and uh, I've been drunk this whole time trying to finger bang that fucking lady agent. Not knowing me too will eventually come around. Oh, it's a DT Tosh. Let me write that down. It was me, Stan Hope, Louis C.K., uh, Mitch Hedberg, uh, Daniel Tosh was there. Nobody knew he was like a really young comedian. And Hedberg had, uh, I'm mean, sorry, Stan Hope did something where he was, everybody like start talking about this guy. Daniel Tosh is like the greatest. He's the hottest thing. And uh, eventually, Dan Tosh, and we don't know if we're responsible for it, but yeah, he became kind of the bell of the ball in that. And then the last night when it was the closing night, we told him, yeah, we told him this entire ruse that we'd been perfecting for four days, and he was kind of pissed. And we went back to one of our hotel rooms one night, and it was Doug Stanhope, Doug Stanhope's brother, Lisa Sunstead, female comedian, and uh, and Mitch. And there was some girl who liked Mitch who came back to the hotel room with us. And she had gone to the bathroom at one point. And I think it was Stano. Of course, it was Stano. Goes, uh, hey, everybody, let's take off our clothes and let's all be sitting here naked when she comes back out. And without 
missing a beat. We all jumped up, except for Lisa Sunset kept her clothes on. But the rest of us stripped completely naked and we're sitting there acting casual like nothing happened. And uh, Hedberg, the comedic genius that he is, picks up the phone and pretends like he's talking on the phone. And he's, we're all just sitting there completely naked. And like the girl was confused and we all laughed our heads off hysterically a few minutes later. By late 1998, Hedberg had portrayed a cranky short order cook in an episode of That 70s Show, appeared on Premium Blend, and recorded an episode for the inaugural season of Comedy Central Presents. He'd also met Canadian comic Lynn Shawcroft, who would later become his wife. Yet he remained largely rootless, taking temporary addresses or living on the road. Nevertheless, his work ethic remained uncompromised. His output, the envy of fellow comics. An interesting fact about Hedberg is he would never take a tag. Like all comedians, like, you know, you you see a guy and you're friends with a guy and you go, hey, man, I really like that joke. Have you ever thought about adding this line to it? And, you know, I think every comedian um, has been given tags by their friend comedians. And um, me and Mitch had a great relationship. And I knew a lot of I've saw other comedians try and give him tags. He would never take a tag. He always felt like his jokes had to be purely from him. And I think that that was uh, a really beautiful thing. There's no sentence of Hedberg's that was ever written by anybody else. Everything came purely from him. The stereotype of the comic was like walking around with your notebook, you know, oh, I got to get that. But he actually really used his notebook. Like he, like his notebook, like there was things in there and like, you know, drawings and all that kind of stuff. And I was always like, man, that's, that's pretty amazing that like, you know, he does do that much writing. He really does. Whereas everybody else is kind of like, it was a prop. Oh, let me get out my notebook and see what's up. And it's like the same joke for the last year and a half, you know, but for him, there always was something new coming up, you know, something he was trying, something he was working on. He was always coming up with stuff, uh, remarkably, because he and I partied a lot. And in my history of drug use, I've always personally found that cocaine is the least creative drug there is. And Mitch and I did a lot of cocaine together, 1998 to 2000 in that period, uh, when I was living in New York City, and he was living there. And, you know, we'd be up for days, and like, he'd have a new five minutes of material. And I'd ask him, you know, hey, man, you know, when we were doing coke with those black guys by the Holland Tunnel, when did you have time to write a joke about cinnamon bun incense sticks? I like cinnamon rolls. That's why I wish they made a cinnamon roll incense, because I don't always have time to make a pan. Perhaps I'd rather light a stick and have my roommates wake up with false hopes. You know, it was remarkable. His brain just seemed to operate on a different level. But he was such a workhorse just for his own amusement. Everything was for Hedberg's own amusement, even you. And you still don't know if Hedberg really liked you or not. And it's, it's a curse. A very important thing to me, and it's beyond comedy with Mitch and how I feel about him, is that, you know... I had this big buildup. I was like kind of the, you know, hot young comedian at this point and I, on Comedy Central. And I had uh, I had a sitcom on NBC, 96 to 97. And it, it was only on for a year. It didn't represent who I was. And then, um, you know, I was left with a big bag of money afterwards and I moved to New York City. And I got a rock star apartment in the Wall Street area. And Mitch's friendship, at that time, he was becoming like the hugest comedian in the world. And show business had gone completely ice cold on me. And the fact that Mitch remained my friend and always like kind of treated me like, you know, I was a really special, great comedian that, um, uh, I mean, just, you know, he always treated me with love and respect. And in this period, when we really partied together, I can't tell you how invaluable that was to me at the time from completely slipping off, um, you know, the edge and going into the abyss. Mitch had this really horrendous apartment near, right at the entrance of the Holland Tunnel. Uh, around the time, I think 97, when I was going to New York a lot, trying to find an apartment. And then uh, 98, I got this rock star apartment in the Wall Street area and Hedberg had moved into the Chelsea Hotel. And the Wall Street area and the Chelsea Hotel are very close to each other. I mean, it's not that far of a walk, like whatever, half hour. And we would either party at my apartment 
uh, at 71 Broadway, apartment 18B, uh, or at Hedberg's place in, um, in the Chelsea. And he had like two electric guitars in his room. And like, you know, we, we'd do Coke, he'd be playing guitars or in my, um, we were always playing music and partying and having fun and laughing and, you know, telling each other jokes and ideas and stuff. And in my apartment, I had, you know, several thousand CDs. We'd be down there. Uh, it was always, if I always preferred partying in my apartment, cause if we had partied at Mitch's apartment, then I would be walking home at six or seven in the morning when all these suits in the wall street area were rushing around. And I felt like a vampire trying to get home before the sun went down. It was originally the customs house, but now it's the native American museum. There's these beautiful statues in front. It's right down in wall street. And, uh, Mitch and I did, this pure LSD a few times and just wandered around this lower Manhattan, you know, this battery park. We climbed on the statues. We'd walk around the world trade center. Mitch was a lot of fun to do drugs with. I think he lived in New York for a while. And I don't remember when we came friendly, but we did some shows together and we co-headlined a show at the Tempe improv. I remember that. And I shared a condo. We flew to on the same flight to, um, to Phoenix and I was, uh, I think this was Continental Airlines at the time, which is no longer an airline. But I had a certain status with them, like gold, where I could actually upgrade myself and someone who I was traveling with. So I kind of just walked to the counter with Mitch. I don't know if this is going to work. And I uh, hand him the card and she types into the little computer thing and then boom, spits out two first class tickets. And so we ended up sitting and he fell asleep immediately. And I was kind of like, Mitch, man, I this is pretty huge what I just did for you. <laughs> and then he just kind of woke up and he goes, Hey, thanks. And I remember we showed up at the condo and it was, we were locked out. And then the owner of the club was just like, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to put you up at the Marriott. And, and uh, I wasn't sure if he meant, and I was like, Oh, he's, there's no way he's going to put us in the Marriott and then get the door open to the condo and move us back into the condo, which is exactly what happened. But so we had this, I went from the Marriott where I was all settled to, um, to going to the back to the comedy condo, which with its lack of enough towels and stuff like that. I mean, I think we're pretty good. We were pretty good match because, um, I mean, energy levels are somewhat similar, but yet different enough joke styles to where we weren't stepping on each other. But that's the only time I've ever, I went on the road with him. But then I guess I just knew him from New York. We were always together at the Comedy Cellar in New York. It was a really exciting time in the Comedy Cellar because it wasn't sold out every night. And they could have some rough crowds in there. And you could smoke back then. So the Comedy Cellar in like the late 90s was really like a smoky jazz joint. It was really beautiful. And, uh, you know, all these brilliant comedians are there and everybody, we would always end up at the end of the night there. And I got to see Mitch do so many sets he always destroyed, even if he was like kind of a little too wasted. Mitch and I were kind of like astronauts going on space missions when it came to drugs. We would go on these space missions and do different things, mushrooms or Coke or whatever. I, uh, I was around him when he, I think when he first started getting into heroin, because um, I told Mitch it was the one thing I never wanted to do because I was afraid of needles. And uh, he came to me to the, at the comedy cellar one night and he, he was really excited and he said, I have a surprise for you. And we go back to his place and uh, he had gotten powdered heroin for me. So thoughtful because I didn't like needles. And he was with this friend of his that he'd gone to high school with. And I think that's the guy who got him into heroin. I don't know. Um, Rose doesn't want to do it. More for us, man. And, uh, I watched them snort it, I, you know, and, uh, and, and I, I hung out with them all night, you know, and I would drink, I'm sitting there smoking and drinking and I'd be like, how's it, what's, how's it feel now, Mitch? Oh, Rosie, you gotta try this, man. You know, they're just lying on the floor. At some point well, when you're young comics growing up together and you both become headliners, you never see each other anymore because there's, you know, 
Uh, unless it's in a rare passing where you're both headlining the same town. You're not working together anymore, but we ended up co-headlining yet again at Acme Comedy Club, which was kind of my home club for a while and his hometown. And it was a full week. Like this is a you know, Wednesday through Saturday or Wednesday through Sunday. Like Hedberg, uh, you know when the joke has some reality to it. And he had a joke, something to the effect of, you know, when you uh, have something that you love and then you do something that you love even more, it ruins the thing that you used to love. It's something to that effect. Like when you like to smoke pot, but then someone sprinkles heroin into your pot. Regular pot is not as good anymore. Something to that effect, which I'm sure he's rolling over in his grave listening to me assassinate but i know he hasn't done that joke all week and i know that he derives most of these jokes from something real so we're doing a massive amounts whirlwinds of cocaine backstage after the second show that weekend and uh i said are you, are you really fucking with heroin and he said hey man i have no intention of slowing down like get out of my face don't fuck with me about that like, cause I, I saw that he was telling the truth, which he didn't mean to, cause everyone thinks it's a joke. I know it's not a joke. Well, it was fucked up. And that's the fucked up thing about heroin. Like when we did those shows in Houston, man, it was all, it was always fun. It was always, let's, you know, let's see, there's always cool people in Houston. Let's meet people. Let's have an experience. Let's have a party. And it was always like, it was, uh, he always wanted to hang out with people. And then after he got into heroin, then it was like, he didn't really want to hang out anymore. He wanted to go back to wherever he was staying and, you know, do his thing. Nineteen ninety-eight had also marked the year Hedberg embarked upon his dream project: writing, starring in, and shooting the independent film *Los Enchiladas* around Minnesota's Maplewood Mall. Then girlfriend Janet Johnson also starred and produced. Comedic collaborators included line producer Felicia Michaels, editor Jay Chandrasekhar, and actors Brian Mallow, Chard Hogan, Dave Mordal, Mark Marin, Todd Berry, and Dave Attell. Though the movie premiered at 1999's Sundance Film Festival, its reception dealt a blow to Hedberg's filmmaking aspirations. Hedberg would continue to do all this video stuff. He was so infatuated with being a movie maker. He was a self-starter. From the beginning, pulled it from the clubs to the theaters. And, um, you know, he doubled down with his money. Like, he didn't, you know, go out and buy... Well, he did go out and buy some crazy stuff, but he, he doubled down and he made that movie, Los Enchiladas, which uh, is... He was the first guy of the comics I knew who said, you know, I'm going to make a movie. I want to make a movie. I want to be in a movie. I want to direct a movie. I want to write a movie. And he was the first guy to actually do it. Mitch had a lot of menial jobs coming up. He worked at a, a Mexican joints. He worked in the kitchen. I mean, the, Los Enchiladas was about the, like that whole world that's happening on the, the back end of, of a restaurant. You could tell he had done enough time back on the line cooking that he knew what was funny and uh, what, what could be a vehicle to show that that whole just the craziness backstage with mitch you know i only knew him as this road guy like we'd party and like you know he could hold his own drinking and you know we go to a strip club like that kind of thing and uh he uh it was weird to go to his house and how like basically what a normal normal life he had you know uh you know i got to meet his mom and um you know his dad and his sister and uh in his house they had a picture of mitch where he was um he was an actor on some movie, like he was in a movie or something, like a real movie, like he had been doing acting before, you know, and everybody looked at Mitch and said, like, you know, he definitely should be an actor because he was a good looking guy and like there was no one like him. So you're like, he's kind of like a unique character, you know, it's only a matter of time till someone finds him. But back then, even you could see that, like, he really did want to, like, do his own projects and get in front of the camera besides doing stand up. And he really went with all the comics. And now you see that all the time in movies where it's like a lot of comics kind of riffing and, you know, throwing lines at each other. And so once again, he was ahead of the curve. I was like blown away that he got that location and that, you know, it was so um, well prepared when we got there that like they really did put a lot of time. And it wasn't like one of these things where you're like, you know, you set up the equipment and then everyone just fights about what it's going to be. You know, like everyone has an idea. He knew what he wanted. And uh, I would say that 
like you could see that there's a lot of friends of friends involved, you know, and a lot of people who either want to act or shouldn't act. And I'll put myself in that group. We filmed at the hotel with the hotel fully in business. So we would like shoot a scene and then someone would come up to check in. We had to step back. And then, so that was kind of funny in a way to do that. But, uh, yeah, I don't remember. I think he got me to dance in a scene, which I'd never, which I'm not a big dancer, believe it or not. Then I found out all these fucking people are like Todd Barry and Dave Attell and Mark Marin. All these people are doing parts in this movie. And then he's like, oh, man, I'm sorry I didn't make you a part. And so we tried to, he tried to force a part in because we he has to do some B-roll elevator scene. And then I come in and I just say something and he says something back just to, he felt awful that I didn't give you a part. So he shoehorned one in and then it got cut anyway. <laughs> then he felt bad about that. Now, I don't think I ran into Doug on the set. <laughs> It was someone's car. I think that's really what the set was. The trailers were cars. And then later on, I was at the uh, the screening of it at Sundance. Uh, not because I was invited. I happened to have shitty gigs in that part of the world. Not in Park City per se, but like Rollins, Wyoming, four, four hours down the road. So I went to see that. And at that point... He, there was a big rift. It was a very uncomfortable situation because I think he had just left Jana for Lynn Shawcroft and then there was a squabble over who owns the rights at Sundance. So now there's two camps of Los Enchiladas, the movie, and they hate each other and there's a palpable tension and I sat through that movie at the screening at... Uh, at Sundance, and it was not well received. <laughs> there are people walking out. It was late at night, so they're like, all right, I saw a lot of fucking movies, and I don't know who all these people are, or I don't get it. And they were, and yeah, Mitch, I could see him visibly shrink for all that work. Like, he put every fucking penny into that and all his motivation. That it didn't get picked up, or it didn't progress, and I think maybe that turned him off of it for a while i think i do remember some screenings yeah it's, it's just weird that uh, you'd go through the trouble of making a whole movie and then shelve it basically and i think he said he spent twenty five thousand dollars on it and twenty five thousand dollars was like everything if you had twenty five thousand dollars you're gonna spend all of that to make a, a movie and an independent movie like who watches this shit i don't like i couldn't understand investment in the future there's no future we're getting drunk at a bar buy twenty five thousand dollars worth of shots you stupid prick and i remember telling him that i thought it was a mistake not to put that out in some way i said it's just a shame because that's like a that that is a, such a part of his comedy and his life that it should I thought it should be out in, in, in some ways and not someone bootlegging a copy of it, but something that he could put together. And I, I mean, I, I would have hoped that that would, would have been the plan. The rare comedian who became known for his albums above all else, Hedberg never waited around for anyone else to offer him a deal. Ironically, it was a self-made debut, 1999 Strategic Grill Locations, that would lead to the founding of Comedy Central Records. Even after shocking arrest and serious health scare, 2003 follow-up disc Mitch Altogether would go on to become one of the label's all-time top-selling releases. Mitch would always stay in touch. It was weird. I would just get a phone call years later out of the blue, and he'd just say, hey. I was now living in Seattle, and whenever he came to town, I would, I would make a point to go see him. But I, then I would do what I do, which is, hey, you're not, you're not really pushing your merch, dude. The merch I remember he was selling was uh, the first CD. So I would start barking, which was embarrassing to him, because I always wanted everyone to leave with a CD, because it was just CDs back then. And he's like, tone it down, Shaley. <laughs> Like, hey, who wants, a, who wants a CD? Hey, he's right here. And it's like, Mitch is just like, just let him go, man. Just, <laughs> this is not the way we do this. So, I mean, we sold more merch. 
the Houston Laugh Stop, the, another brilliant thing that Mark Babbitt did was he mic'd the room. So everybody's first albums were from there. And it was because the audiences were so great. They were super savvy comedy people. And the room was mic'd. But I, 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 I remember seeing him play with Chuck Savage, who had did the stand-up bass for him. So don't fuck up the bass tonight, Chuck, because we're on a CD here. Let's just fucking keep it, keep it going. Don't fuck up a scale. This joke's all gonna go right here. So I wish I could play literally now. I'd kick some fucking ass. I'd be way better than before. Then back up now. All right. That joke kicked off the CD right there. Kind of weak, man. I got an ant farm. Them fellas didn't grow shit. What about some carrots, maybe, for me? I like carrots. I, I dressed up for the CD. I haven't slept for 10 days because that would be too long. Like Henry Phillips and I would do shows like Goldfinger was one of the bars where uh, Henry and I would do shows where Henry would play guitar behind me and you know, try to give me pace. So I was doing stuff with music behind me and then he came out with a fucking Chuck Savage playing bass and yeah, his one, his first CD was like, motherfucker, that's, I've been doing this. My apartment is infested with koala bears. It's the cutest infestation ever. Way better than cockroaches. When I turn on the light, a bunch of koala bears scatter. And I don't want them to, you know? I'm like, hey, hold on, fellas. Let me hold one of you. And feed you a leaf. Why do koala bears, they're so fucking cute. Why, why do they have to be so far away from me? We need to ship a few over and I will apprehend one and hold them. All right, and pet them on the back of his head. His stuff is timeless in that since it was not, it was also very esoteric stuff. It was very like things that like, you never really connected those two dots together, and he did, you know, like with the koala bears and, um, you know, all those different, I guess, images that he would throw out there. I don't know why this is my favorite, but it's just, it's just I think, the perfect joke. I used to be a hot tar roofer. Yeah, I remember that day. <laughs> it's just so simple, and it's always fucking good. Anything where he says a dirty word, there's the, uh, you just cut this in, because I, I, I'll do it a disservice. The uh, Sometimes a, a song has a special meaning for a special someone, but sometimes that meaning degrades the song. Say, I say, some songs have a special meaning for a man in regards to a special woman, but this can backfire, because maybe the song had deeper meaning to begin with, but now it's been cheapened. We are the world, we are the children, we are the ones who make a better life, so let's keep on giving. Remember that song, baby? The night I fucked you in the pet cemetery? <laughs> That's our song. I'm Eddie Brill, and uh, I worked at The Letterman Show. Zoe Friedman, who was the booker at Letterman, who was responsible for me as well, getting on the show, uh, had booked him on the show. And he, I was working there, and I saw him, and he was brilliant. I was working at the show starting in 97, but I was just a warm-up then. I left yeah, the show in 2000. Mitch Hedberg was one of those that made my job easy or satisfying and rewarding. I was really grateful to work with him. 
and have that opportunity to share what I thought was really special with the Late Show audience. And it was one of the sort of bookings that I was most proud of. I started booking in 2001. I think it was April of 2001. Zoe had left to go to Comedy Central. I was booking the show and I, you know, of course, booked Mitch. He's holding the mic stand with one hand, which takes away the ability to use that side of your body because now you're stuck holding the stand. And the other hand, the mic is shaking. So I can't say for sure what was going on inside of him, but his hands were shaking and it became pretty obvious. But uh, again, the audience loved him. He crushed because they loved his mind and they loved his comedy and they loved him because he was so humble and, uh, you know, he, he wasn't a, some cocky guy. He was, a, he was the, one of the most vulnerable comics. And to me, the strength and the best comics that I like are always the most vulnerable ones. This is Jack Vaughn. I started and ran Comedy Central Records. And I started Comedy Central Records because... I had seen Mitch Hedberg's set on Premium Blends and then went online in the early days of the internet and found Mitch selling his record, uh, Strategic Grill Locations, which he had self-produced. And I couldn't believe that there was anything that good available that wasn't widely distributed. Mitch was one of the first comics I signed to Comedy Central Records because, yeah, that Strategic Grill Locations record is basically unassailable. It's one of the best things ever and still holds up to this day. Whereas a lot of comedy records, I don't feel, really stand the test of time. The strategic relocations was just amazing. I know a lot about cars, man. I can, I can look at a car's headlights and tell you exactly which way it's coming. I say, I say the word totally too much. I use the word totally way too much. I need to change it and use a word that is different but means the same thing. Mitch, do you like submarine sandwiches? All encompassingly. <laughs> this shirt is dry clean only, which means it's dirty. <laughs> yeah, thanks, that's Chuck there. How about a round of applause for Chuck? He does. The cover that Mitch had put on uh, Strategic Grill Locations initially was just a digital drawing of himself, and it was uh, it was pretty crude, intentionally so. But we took the record and did another pass at it, cut out a couple jokes that he didn't like, uh, tightened it up a bit, and then put a new cover on it. I was like, "What does Strategic Grill Locations mean?" And he told me that the the joke was that he was working. At a restaurant, he was working as a as a cook in a kitchen, and the manager laid into him for not placing the hot dogs and the hamburgers in the right part of the grill. And he said to himself, "Like I know I got to get a better job when I'm thinking about strategic grill locations." Uh, and that was that was cool to hear because I, I don't know that anyone has ever heard that joke. I don't know if it's available anywhere. And then Mitch altogether was the new one. He had the material down. He'd been working on it a while. We recorded it at the Acme Comedy Club in Minneapolis. I have an old CD. See, this one will be in stores. The only way I could get my old CD into a store is if I would take one in and leave it. <laughs> they, say this, they say, sir, you forgot this. No, I did not. <laughs> that is for sale. Please alphabetize it. At this point, he wasn't a household name, and the, those shows weren't sold out. But the crowd who was there, it's sort of a secret thing. They knew him and loved him and were really, really into it. I was in downtown Boise, Idaho, and I saw a duck. And I knew the duck was lost, because ducks ain't supposed to be downtown. There's nothing for him there. So I went to a Subway sandwich shop. I said, let me have a bun. But she wouldn't sell me just the bun. She said I had to have something on it. She told me it's against regulations for Subway to sell just the bun. I guess the two halves ain't supposed to touch. <laughs> So I said, all right, we'll put some lettuce on, which they did. They said, that'll be $1.75. I said, it's for a duck. They said, all right, well, then it's free. See, I did not know that. Ducks eat for free at Subway. 
Had I known that, I would ordered a much larger sandwich. <laughs> Let me have the steak fajita sub. But don't bother ringing it up. It's for a duck. <laughs> there are six ducks out there, and they all want sun chips. He had jokes that you thought were jokes, but they weren't. This show is sponsored by Bisquick. We are the Bisquick Comedy All-Stars. After the show, I'm going to be flipping flapjacks for the people. And but what you find out later uh, is he actually wrote to Bisquick for sponsorship. So he got some free pancake batter in the mail. <laughs> And you go, this is all true. Hedberg was, he really did, you know, get free bread from a subway for a duck. It was one of the first times we had hung out. And I was really surprised because his appearance, he was much skinnier. And the delivery was much more rapid fire. It was just boom, boom, boom. And it was really hard to pull, say, 42, 43 minutes out of that recording just because he was going so quickly. And when you're a one-liner comic, you burn through material pretty quick. They say the recipe for Sprite is lemon and lime, but I tried to make it at home. There's more to it than that. <laughs> Want some more homemade Sprite? Not till you figure out what the fuck else is in it. <laughs> I like refried beans. That's why I want to try fried beans, because maybe they're just as good and we're wasting time. <laughs> you don't have to fry them again after all. I eat a lot of sandwiches. Who doesn't, man? Sandwiches are easy to eat. But I hate sandwiches at New York delis. Too much fucking meat on a sandwich. It's like a cow with a cracker on either side. <laughs> what would you like, sir? A pastrami sandwich. Anything else? Yeah, a loaf of bread and some other people. <laughs> and then Mitchell got busted in Austin. And, you know, I've heard a million stories about it, that he had heroin paraphernalia on him and he was arrested. And then his leg was completely fucked up and he had to go do a crazy surgery. And he had the problem with his leg, you know, which is uh, going through the airport security and, you know, he had basically a hardcore incident with his leg. And I remember a lot of people flying down there to help him out. We get a call from Austin, Texas. Hedberg is in the hospital. He's going to have his leg amputated. I called him in the hospital and he's already getting deluged by all the fucking local open micers. And I talked to him. He's like, if you, is there anything you need? No, man, I'm all right. And God knows what the fuck drugs he was on in a hospital bed with his gangrenous leg. But if you've ever seen uh, Requiem for a Dream, yeah, the ending of that was exactly where Hedberg was. They discovered his gangrene in a fucking Austin jail as he tried to fly out with heroin and noticed or smelled his pus leg. And then next thing you know, here comes fucking Nurse Ratchet in the Civil War with a bone saw. They thought he was going to lose his leg, which is pretty amazing that they saved it. You know, it took a lot of, a lot of time in the hospital to get him, get him back up on his feet. So he rebounds from that. They save his leg. He's not an amputee. He's not a pirate. There's no clip-clop, clip-clop. And he did have a, a, a sort of an odd limp for the rest of it after that, you know. So whatever they did, obviously they saved his leg, which is, is amazing and good for him. But I think it bugged him. And I wonder if that caused him to medicate himself more or not. I always wondered if that, you know, if he had pain or just the, the situation that he'd gotten himself into. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Mitch was in the hospital and he was staring down the barrel of uh, having to have his leg potentially amputated. And that was very soon after we recorded the record. So I was talking to him in the hospital and I said, look, we are not going to release this record until you're better. We've got just focus on making sure you make it through and focus on your health and we can release this at any point. We'll just keep working on it and editing it and making it better and better. And he goes, Oh, no, man, just call it one-legged one-liners. And, like, that's the humor of this guy. That's what makes him so amazing. And I suggested, well, hey, uh, that's, that's pretty dark, man. Uh, how about we call it Mitch altogether? Because Mitch has a joke about how you uh, should call corn on the cob corn and everything else corn off the cob because you wouldn't cut off my arm and call it Mitch and then reattach it and call it Mitch altogether. 
<laughs> and he goes, oh, yeah, man, I like that. It's more optimistic, uh, which was amazing. And, you know, that joke didn't appear on Mitch altogether. So it held the, the great tradition. We released Strategic Relocations and Mitch altogether at the same time. Releasing them both at the same time, it gave us the ability to release a new record and then have something else out there at the same time for people first discovering them. Like, oh, I love this. I'm going to check this out also. Both of those records are in the top five or seven best-selling Comedy Central Records albums. Letterman was sick for a while. He had shingles and he had guest hosts. Vince Vaughn did really well. Paul Schaefer was amazing at it. And my hero, Elvis Costello, was doing it. I knew that Mitch Hedberg would be the perfect stand-up for that show because he just fit the sensibility of that show. Yeah, and his face is a little, um, what would be the right word, white, uh, pallid? I don't know. His face seems, you know, he seems a little gaunt. You know, the set was still good. It was still funny. It was good. There was moments where he seemed detached, but, you know, he was a great comic and a great writer, and the audience loved him. He was humble, funny, smart, quirky, perfect for The Letterman Show, and he was a big hit, and everyone loved him. The band loved him, too, so much. I mean, because they're artists and they just loved his style. And I know that members of the band would go see him when he'd come to New York at the comedy clubs. And I think Will Lee, the bass player, was a, the, one of his biggest fans. And so uh, when he was coming on the show, the, the, the place was excited about it. Mitch, in his 10 appearances, seemed like he was home when he was there. Hedberg's relationship with Comedy Central deepened in 2003, when he was booked on the inaugural Comedy Central Live Road Tour. Following 50 dates from September through December, ticket demand added a dozen shows in the new year. Given the company, Hedberg was thrilled to be along for the ride. Hedberg didn't really sweat the details when it came to uh, promotion on the web. I think someone else was working his website. Uh, MitchHedbrook.com and that was back in 2001 I think it's about that time but he didn't he didn't have anything to do with it other than he would contact that person every once in a while it was, it was just real bare bones I mean this is pre Squarespace and all that stuff this is you had to write the HTML for it and then I it was in uh, August of 2001 I think someone let it slip the lapse so the URL went up for grabs and then it became you know some someone's property and it, it was going to cost us money and then in 2002 I that's when I met up with Mitch again I was in Seattle and I was working for an internet company and I said why don't we just do dot net and once again he didn't really have anything to do with it he just I did it and uh then he got into it he started doing uh, weekly updates and things like that and he would handwrite the message that he wanted me to post on the website in his script and then mail me a letter and then I would open the letter and then type that in and post that so that was just his style of doing it I was doing the insomniac show and we were in Atlanta and we needed to go um, you know, in the beginning of every show, I would do stand-up to show what town I was in. And that was really kind of uh, the best and also the hardest part of the show because I would have to come up with new material pretty much every week and try and make it a little topical, try and make it a little, like, regional, like, to where I am and everything like that. So it was a lot of pressure. And I was like, well, I know I can go to the Punchline, you know, in Atlanta, which is a great club. Hedberg was in town at the Punchline. So now I hadn't worked with him for years. He was headlining on his own. He had done, you know, these Letterman appearances. You know, he'd done, his, um, you know, stuff for Comedy Central. So he was a powerful headliner. So him opening for me, like, forget about that. Like, he now was a force of nature. And I was like, can I come on and just do, like, a little taping of my act, you know, for this show? And he was like, of course, why not, blah, blah, blah. And... I finally got to be in front of his crowd. Like he had his own crowd and they were like, kind of like had the feel of like a fish tour, but they were not those people that were comedy people, like fanatical comedy people. And pretty much every word out of my mouth was like, what is it? You know, it's like they had already been like, 
they were super waiting for Mitch. That was it. It was all about Mitch. I was like, wow, I've done a lot of these and, you know, on the road for the Insomni show. I've done them in diners and, you know, whatever. And this one was like one of the toughest because I was in front of Hedberg's crowd. You know, it was like really, I was like proud of him, but I also kind of was like, damn, this sucks for me, you know? Mitch was starting to get fans. People were starting to show up for him. He was headlining at clubs and he was starting to gain momentum. You could definitely see him heating up. You know, he was playing Carolines. He played Acme. You know, he played Punchline in San Francisco. He was starting to get a reputation for himself as a very funny act. And in our business, we want funny people and you also want them to sell tickets. And that was starting to happen too. They, Slowly but surely, people were showing up to see him and hang out. You know, I used to try and book him as much as possible. I don't know how many times I did, but he was always sort of one that we that we wanted to have in our, you know, stable, if you will. And I got put into business with Jamie Foxx first and some co-promoters. And then I want to say I'd, I got into Chris Rock's business and we finally talked him into touring. And then I needed to come up with something. Obviously, Mitch was popping. David Tell was popping with, was it Insomniac? Yeah, was it, yeah. I mean, he was popping anyway. People were talking about him. People were talking about Mitch. And Louis Black was making huge waves and uh, 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 doing it. And I started to think to myself, you know, I don't know if I stole the idea from comedians, of, not comedians, of uh, the kings of comedy. I got in my head that one plus one plus one equals five. You know, it was just the way to do it. And I was you know, man crush on all of these guys and I love them all. And I got, I got to put a tour together. We all had our own audiences by that point. And I guess the whole idea was like, well, we'll bring all three of them together and we'll tour it up. And, you know, between the three of them, they'll be able to fill out a theater because all of us were kind of club acts. I think Lewis had already jumped into the theater world. But for me and Hedberg, we were not theater acts. And there was, you know, some weird caveats because... I envisioned it as a try headliner where each act got equal time and then we'd hire a local opener to come out and do it. And there was definitely pushback from, because Comedy Central had corporate sponsorships and all that, there was this huge powwow about if Mitch could even be on the tour or not. So through uh, all the uh, magic of Dave Becky and Three Arts... They reestablish Hedberg's image, and now he gets on as an opening act for Lewis Black, David Tell, and opening Mitch Hedberg, where everyone knows Hedberg should be. He's a headliner on that show. I mean, they all are, but Hedberg in small print on the poster chapped Hedberg's ass. Just because I'm a junkie, <laughs> fuck you. He didn't say that. What happened was that, you know, Mitch, who wanted to do this, agreed to not be fully equally built. So if you go back and look at artwork or posters or anything like that, it's like Lewis Black, David Tell with Mitch Hedberg. I don't think he wasn't making as much money, but I also think with what happened to him, he was sort of glad to still be on the tour. You know, he seemed to be excited and jazzed about it. I could care less if I opened, closed, or middled, or anything like that. But we were flip-flopping, so the whole idea was like, who gets to close this one, who closes this one? The whole idea of what, you know, and Hedberg was kind of added into that, into that world of like, you know, he's a legitimately great headliner, but because of his situation with drugs and like he was sick and all that kind of stuff, you know, it wasn't super reliable. So that was why, like, there was a lot of times where he was opening. I think he really, he really felt bad about that. The shows were good, you know, and all these characters and, and uh, vibe wise, it felt pretty good, if not great, if not fantastic. I went to a show at the Portland at Crystal Palace uh, for the Lewis Black David Tell show, of which he, Mitch was a support on, on a lot of those dates. And it was crazy packed. And it was, it was fun. I mean, there was a big catering thing backstage and stuff. I found out later that on that tour, Mitch used to fuck with Lewis Black's food all the time. <laughs> he would like write, write some, something in peas on, on his, like he'd take green peas and spell out something. And Lewis Black would have no idea who, who was doing this. So it was just one of those things that tickled Mitch. <laughs> 
There was also somebody kept putting ketchup on our door. And I was like, I wonder who would do that ketchup on the door. I saw it as a, as a silly prank and not a political statement. So we see they're doing this tour. Louis Black and David Tell, all comic favorites. And we had just finished a show in Atlanta and drove like screaming idiots to New Orleans to catch this show. I don't know, it's 10 hours, 12 hours. We got there in time, and Hedberg was very, uh, he was drawn back. He did his show. Attell probably brought me up on stage at some point. Like, Attell always does that. But after the show, Lewis Black is an older gentleman, so he bails out. And Hedberg and Shawcroft, yeah, we can't hang out. I still have a picture of me and Andy Andrist, who was with me, and Hedberg right right after the show in the parking lot, and then they're ditching out. And I guess they're not going to hang out and party, but there's a lot of times with Hedberg, he ducked out because he didn't want to party because he wanted to really party without the judgmental eyes of you staring at his needle. It's just sad to see what the drugs had done by that point to him on the road, where he was like already kind of aloof and a loner, but with the drugs, he isolated even more. The first thing you lose with the drugs is your friends and family. They're the ones who like, we don't know what to do. The night prior to Phoenix was at the Wiltern here in LA. And I'm not going to lie, Mitch was, I think everyone was hammered, to be honest. But I remember Mitch falling down the stairs and then just getting back up again. And everyone was like, are you okay? Are you okay? Because besides the parting we were doing, I never, I never really knew what Mitch was up to. And then I was at my office and I came back and I had a voicemail. I go, hey, Jeff, this is Mitch. I'm on my way to Phoenix. I'm going to make it. And then for whatever reason, maybe like an hour later, hey, Jeff, this is, I don't know, I didn't, phone didn't ring. Hey, Jeff, this is Mitch. I don't think I'm going to make it. <laughs> Please don't fire me from the tour. This is an interesting point. Because in Phoenix, a bunch of people asked for refunds, like an in, like what I would call an inordinate amount. I'm like, huh? Obviously, there were Mitch fans coming, and I think his contribution to that tour was significant in turn, you know, and, and every bit as important as Dave and Lou in terms of what he added to it. People were absolutely there to see him in a big way, so validating in one sense that I was right and I was just so happy that the tour was happening and that it was successful and we did at a whole bunch of dates because it was selling out you know a lot of places two in one night and move on and and yeah that was the only one that he missed but to give him credit and I will give him credit is that it's hard enough to do anything on um, a substance but to still be able to power through like an hour of great comedy is like doubly hard and I don't know if he was trying to be a rock and roll guy or he was trying to self-medicate or, th or something at the end but maybe it's a little bit of both I think also like he felt he felt um, a lot of uh, anxiety because we were all worried about him and it was like one of those things like you know you okay what are you doing you know and stuff is like enough of that already you know he just wanted to live his own life so it was like one of these things where it's like any other job, they'd be like, all right, dude, you got to get in a rehab like right away. Here it was like debatable. Like, well, he did good last night, you know. And then it's like, I don't know, it was this night, you know. So it was like any other kind of comic, but then you're like trying to figure out like, you know, when do you, um, whatever. It's just so much, so much, um, uh, even thinking about it now, it just makes me kind of just sad because it's just, there's a bunch of names now of guys who like this. So, so whatever. I don't know where they are. I hope I have them still. He would sell, send postcards from the road. Just in New Orleans, in Des Moines, that kind of stuff. After the uh, uh, Comedy Central tour with him and Lewis and Dave was over, he sent me, and still in my office, a um, picture of Lou, picture of Dave, and a picture of Mitch putting in the gas into the car because he was not quite the same as them. And a note in the back saying that he, uh, that he really enjoyed the tour. So long ago now. I loved like hanging with him. I have this great picture of Mitch Hedberg in an airport because we were flying and he's sitting on his luggage smoking his pipe, which I always thought was so weird that he had this pipe. <laughs> 
And then he uh, he uh, was just sitting there, and I was like, man, that's such a great, like, road shot. You know, we were all kind of, like, so young, we're, like, romanticizing the road and, like, you know, out on the road and all, you know, got to get out to that road and like, got to get off the road. I think that he felt at home a little bit on the road, because I do too, the hotels, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Everybody always bitch and moan about it, but it's still at the end of the day. It's like, I think for us, it was like, it was an adventure for sure, but it was also just a lot of, uh, we, we kind of ran towards it. Not for the money, whatever, it's just because it felt right. Following July 2004's third appearance at Just for Laughs Montreal, Hedberg and Lynn joined Stephen Lynch for a new Comedy Central Live tour spanning 30 dates across September through December. This time, he enjoyed a co-starring role. They called and he goes, man, I want to I want to keep working. I go, man, we just did all this. Well, I want to keep, want to keep working. And I said, okay, do you want to do it all by yourself? Or do you want to do it with someone else so you don't have to shoulder the entire responsibility of a tour? Because Mitch was flagging a little bit on the road. I mean, he showed up for all the gigs and he was hilarious. But I think towards the end of that Comedy Central, the one with Lou and Dave, it was a bit quieter with him. I'm like, can you, can you do this? Can you do this by yourself or can you do it with someone else? He goes, I prefer to do it with someone else. So we sort of looked around to find someone and the only person with what I would call equal stature in terms of ticket sales and profile that was available and that wanted to work was uh, Stephen Lynch. And it was determined that they would trade off each show. So you're doing two shows in one night. Mitch would open for Stephen and then on the late show, you get the idea of what I'm trying to say. And then from market to market, that was how the plan went. And it sold. It started to sell slightly smaller, less ambitious venues because we were just, you know, trying to be prudent about it. I want to say the first night was in Madison, Wisconsin, the Barrymore Theater. I remember a beer bottle breaking somehow. I don't know what it was. And I think it was when Mitch was on stage, you know, like he's stumbly mumbly type of thing. And part of me is like, mm, what's up? You know, there's uh, also the, all right, are you okay? Everything good? We'll see you tomorrow night. And I got a call from Mitch and Lynn, and they said their tour manager, current tour manager, Chris, was a nightmare. They can't do it. They can't have me more than they need me. They had already gotten about a third of the way, maybe half of the way through the tour, and I worked the second half, and then they added dates too. And uh, that was really my first jump into uh, road managing, tour manager. I didn't know what I was doing. I was just trying to get him to the stage and after the show, get him back to the hotel. That's what you do, right? But they didn't have anyone doing merch. They had merch. They just, no one was selling it. <laughs> it was just kind of a shit show. And uh, I tried to uh, do what I could and learned along the way. One would open one night and then the other guy would open the next night. Mitch, always oh, strong, close, just bringing the house down. But he would go right out on stage right after Stephen Lynch, which had a great show, a great performance. And people would be yelling for Lynch. And it was just, I think we were in Chicago when it was just like, come on, man. I like him too, but now it's my turn. There didn't have to be a battle between the two headliners. It was just, they were booked together. And that's how you got that crossover. That's what the goal was. Mitch downplayed it, but it was very, very clear that parting was going on. I didn't mind it, but he had kept telling everyone that it wasn't. And then there was all these telltale signs of, of you know, he's like, you want? No. You know, even though I probably did, I don't want to be a hypocrite, but I couldn't because you're trying to play this role of you, you can't do this. I never saw him do hard drugs, but if something was happening or people were concerned about it, no one was filling me in. And that, that kind of sucks. Not that it, you, I mean, you can't do any, how much can you do when someone's on a destructive path? But it just sucks that I know that they tried to do a backstage rider that was basically water and ice. <laughs> it's like, what, you think I'm not going to stop at the liquor store and get a bottle of vodka on our own dime just because you're not going to put it in the rider? It was, that was ridiculous. You give a certain amount of license to the performer to what they're doing. 
But sometimes I was, I was wondering what was happening. Like when he would be laying on the ground and, and people weren't ch throwing chairs or booing, you know, but you got to wonder what's going on. And I don't know if he was just tired of being on the road or, but then he would do something fucking totally hilarious. And he'd wrap up in this, you know, 40 foot drape at this old theater from the, you know, 1890s. And he'd be doing a whole fucking thing. And it's like, that's, it's okay if he's standing, but if he's laying on the ground doing a joke, it's not, it's not funny, you know, cause you would see, you know, people would say things at the merch booth and stuff like that. And in, yeah, in emails and, and comments. Last night at the tour, and it was in uh, Tampa. I went in the dressing room, and it was, it was kind of messy, to be honest. There was stuff on the floor and everything, and I sensed something was not good. Just with Mitch, he goes, no, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, you know. And I go, are you doing anything? He goes, no, I promise you I'm not doing anything. I'm good. And then Stephen went out and fucking crushed it beyond belief. He's got guitar, he's everything, he's got these cute songs, whatever, people... <laughs> And I'm looking at Mitch, and I'm just like, ah, it's going to be, this is, this is bad. Like, bad to the point of me, other people there going, yeah, should we just, like, try and call this show? Because he just didn't, he wasn't vibing right. He's, no, man, I got it, you know? And I'm like, all right, you're going to be thrown to the lions. Mitch destroyed. Like, I literally pushing him out there, and yeah, it's going to be bad. And then he, he fucking killed it. And then as soon as he was done, it was that kind of thing. Someone saw him fall over at the hotel. I remember when the, our production person called me and he goes, oh, Mitch Hedberg just fell over in the lobby of the hotel. And I'm like, oh, okay. And that was the last time I ever saw him was, was then. Never one to slow down, Hedberg had a full schedule of work slated for 2005 and beyond. A string of colleges awaited in April, a southern jaunt in May, several Florida improvs in June, maybe even the Edinburgh Festival Fringe beyond that. That March, he set out in his RV, wife Lynn by his side, for a trek through Chicago, Nashville, and into Alabama before heading back north. Following a college gig in Maryland, he performed six shows at Caroline's in New York City and for four nights at the Richmond Funny Bone. He was slated to perform at the Baltimore Improv March 31st through April 3rd. There was very much a discussion of a pilot deal. And I feel like at that time among the networks, especially Comedy Central, because they had really a bird's eye view, there was real interest in doing something with Mitch because he was so great and such an irresistible figure that that talent was was pretty well identified and I think everyone was trying to figure out what's the perfect vehicle for Mitch. I did see him at shows and I always found him funny. I did find him inconsistent. I think that that would be the word I would say. But again, I didn't really know. I And I've been around comedy for so long in my life that I've seen, I mean, it's not just about the drugs, but you have a good set, you have a bad set. I never thought I oh, had a bad set. Oh, it must be this or whatever. It's just like next time he'll do better if there is a next time, you know. Hedberg loved drugs. He loved the life. It got ugly after the fact. I know he was a, a, a drinker and a stoner when we met. And then when he started getting into cocaine, that's when he was starting to tape things. And you go, oh, your cadence is missing. I used to do drugs. I still do, but I used to, too. Now it's, I used to do drugs. I still do, but I used to, too. <laughs> wow, you're doing these bits, but they're like double speed. And then heroin, God knows, but he turned into a fucking wax figure. You guess the thing about the comedy world is a very small world. Everybody was talking about, oh, did you hear was Mitch was falling down in Phoenix? Did you hear he was falling down here? Couldn't finish the thing, holding onto the mic stand, saying, oh, my God, I, you know, the world is spinning or just different stories. It was just you heard a lot that, you know, he would be so fucked up, he would be falling down and stuff. There was oh, definitely yeah. talk about it. Definitely talk. And because I didn't know it to necessarily be factual. So I still call them rumors, but that Mitch was using and that it was a mess and it was getting worse and worse. I remember in this period, I tried to be like a big brother to him and I told him any musician or entertainment biography I ever read whenever anybody started doing heroin it either took him 10 years to 
kick it or it killed them. Looking back on it, that's kind of when our we stopped being so close. I remember like when he was partying once, he told me that uh, his family was giving him a hard time about partying too much. He was I don't need that right now. He just wanted to do his own thing. And he didn't want anybody to try and curb that. Again, a lot of people calling to not work with him. And some of those people honestly were hypocrites because they booked him at the clubs anyway. I won't name names, but it, that was going down, which is, again... Mitch was going to work. You could maybe say no, but that guy would still find a way to get into to clubs and get into gigs. He, he was going to do that. That was his whole life, I want to say. So he wanted to do. I think this is common for comics in that you work so hard to get one gig that you never say no to anything later on. And I know that was definitely going through Mitch's head. He explained it as a, an upside down pyramid where all these people were booking and, you know, people buying tickets and all that. You don't want to let anyone down and you're down there with all this weight right on top of you. And my opinion of that was, yeah, but that's the attitude of someone who's scraping, trying to get something going. He wasn't like that anymore. You can say no. You look back and you're like, could, it, could I have changed anything about him going out? And I don't think so. He knew the bus he was driving. I was updating Mitch's website, because I was still working on MitchHedberg.net. And I would get the dates from the uh, management company. And I saw there was a date coming up at the University of Maryland. And I saw that the opener was Doug Stanhope. And I'm like, there's no fucking way Mitch knows that Doug is opening for him at this show. So I called Doug and I said, hey, I'm going to fly up. Don't call Mitch. Don't let him know what's happening. If you don't know, college gigs do not book people like me. Even back in those days, they book safe acts. Not that Mitch was safe on any level, but the material. There was nothing, you know, could be considered racist or say you didn't use bad language other than an aside. Man, fuck, that fucking joke didn't work. I flew for the show. I met Doug at the airport in Maryland, and then we... We went and waited for him to show up, and he had no idea. And this was the first time I think Mitch had actually seen Doug do a set in like seven years or something. But, uh, you know, it was, it was great seeing two friends, you know, who came up together, and now it's been all this time, and then they get to actually watch each other do their sets. And I went, oh, fuck, I haven't seen Hedberg in forever. He must have requested me for me to be on this bill, because there's no way they'd book me on their own without it being at their own peril. And I showed up and I did the show and I got you know, a, a tepid response, not as violent as I might have thought. And fucking Hedberg just tore that place apart. And I knew the power of Hedberg at that point from other people talking about his secondhand stories. But to see him just destroy a fucking college audience and college audiences are the shittiest, weakest, fucking fragile people. And to see them fucking explode where it's not some kind of Dane Cook atmosphere is doing real fucking jokes and he destroyed so we go back to the hotel on the drive back. I said, hey, Hedberg, thanks for booking me on this. I needed the money. And then I realized by his countenance, he had no idea I was going to be <laughs> on this gig either. And then the guy driving us said, no, I did this. You're my two favorite comedians. And I thought, why not? I go, you're going to get fired for this. <laughs> And he goes, it's my last year or whatever he said. It was a funny moment. And then we went back to the room with Shawcroft and Chaley. And then some kid from the show shows up. Tall, gangly kid with dyed hair, funky color. His dad is Matthew Lesko, the guy on late night TV, well, back in the 90s, that had the question marks all over his suit. And that kid had to come in and name drop his dad to try to get up to Hedberg level of fame. I was just at your show, but you know who my dad is? He's the guy on the weird infomercials. <laughs> but he had cocaine, so we, we lauded him for his attempt. And then we got rid of that kid, and it was just me and Chaley and Shawcroft and Hedberg doing Actually, cocaine. Just, Actually, it was just the three of us. Lynn ducked out. She ducked out, and it was the three of us, and we were sitting there, and you and Mitch were talking about, why the fuck aren't we touring together? 
why don't we tour together? That's a terrible idea. You guys thought it was a great idea that night. I thought it was amazing. And I thought, why not? The problem is our acts don't go together. Oh, we're not done with fucking University of Maryland yet. We were talking about taking time off and fucking off and going to Costa Rica. And I hadn't moved to Bisbee at that point. But yeah, I was, I was like trying to do different shit. And he goes, man, that's what we've been thinking about me and Lynn. Like we got to take time off because he was legendary for never taking time off. He was on the road all the fucking time in a, a an RV so he could avoid airports where they find gangrene in your heroin leg. I don't know how that works, but I remember us talking about, yeah, we do more Costa Rica kind of shit. Maybe one day kind of shit. And it was it was really sad in the moment that I know he's never going to do that. And then two weeks later, and you can pull up the picture of Hedberg on Howard Stern two days after University of Maryland. And when I say wax figure, it was horrific how he looked. That picture is especially alarming from the Stern show, yeah. Mitch performed a series of shows at Caroline's and we were talking about the next record. And I think that was in March and he was looking to record his next album in October and had about 20 minutes of material ready to go for it. And he had a bunch of ideas that he was honing and was very, very confident that by October he would have the next album ready to go. I had an email that they were looking to take time off in July or something around them because we were actually talking about them, Mitch and Lynn going to Edinburgh, like putting together a pitch for them to do Edinburgh and to be out of America for a while. And then that never happened. When I got the call, I wasn't shocked. I think I got a little bit weepy when my, is my assistant called me, Melissa Burnley. And she said, uh, it's really, you know, Mitch has died. And I just remember in an odd way, it was relief. Does that sound terrible to say that? I go, I know. Why am I not surprised about this? It was coming. If he was going to keep going at that level of what he was up to, and if 10% of what I'd heard was true, then that was going to be the outcome. That was just going to be it. It was just a phone call from Al Madrigal, who had opened for uh, some of the dates on the Hedberg Lynch tour. And we had become friends, and... I was living in Tampa, so I was on the East Coast. He's in California. Calls me up and goes, uh, dude, I'm so sorry. And I go, what? And he goes, oh, shit. You don't know? I go, what? what are you talking about? He goes, oh, dude. Yeah, Hedberg. Yeah, Hedberg died. The site was fucking crashed already because of people looking to see what was going on. I called Doug and told him. And then for the next three days, I was frantically trying to get server space to move up to a server that will take all the hits because of all the traffic and then to get the message up from his publicist and then from his parents and things like that and to, and to find out what the fuck was going on. But uh, yeah, it all started with that that call from Al. That, that was it. He's dead. And there wasn't really not that much information. I remember... Taking up the phone and it was, I, I believe your words were Jahir Hedberg and that's all you have to say. It's like Ralphie Bay or anyone else. That you, but he was the first, Hedberg was the first of what you would consider at least mentally inner circle of people that like, oh fuck, he's dead. And I, I remember I was with Renee then and we both fell apart. And I remember saying to her, you know, I'm not crying for him. I'm crying for us. We're all fucking suspect now. We're all mortal. We can all die. Let's get the fuck out of this town. You called uh, Stern because they were calling it a hoax because it was April 1st. No, it's March 29th or 30th. It was it was like two days yeah. before April Fool's Day. And uh, oh, it was an April Fool's prank. Well, that only Mitch would pull an April Fool's <laughs> prank on not April Fool's Day. Losing a life is loss always. But to the comedy world, that was a big hit and a big loss. 
because he was so funny. And I think he had so many fans, not just fans, but comedians. You know, I think comedians respected him and he was nice. You know, he wasn't a competitive shithead. Well, everyone was crushed. Good guy, hilarious guy. But the first thing I said was the most important thing. Good guy. We rooted for him. Yeah, I miss him and he'll be remembered for as long as people are talking about comedy. He never talked about politics, never talked about sex. I never knew him to, I was always like a news junkie and I thought you had to be on top of it. I was always reading things. I never knew Mitch to read a book or watch the news. And I think that kind of kept his brain pure and clean of things. The way he wrote jokes was just different. They're so like concise in a way and, and simple and devoid of, they weren't political at all. They weren't really about sex very, you know, like he, they were just like, like fucking solid jokes that would stand up that you could see 20 years now, 30 years now being in a joke book somewhere. The beauty of Hedberg's jokes was the economy of words. And the greatest compliment any comedian could have is when your jokes or slang or how you say things enter people's vernaculars. What I loved about Mitch was at the time I felt like in order to be cool, you had to be sort of detached, dour, negative. And Mitch was the complete opposite of that. He was everything about him. I feel like in my mind was positive and he looked at everything in a positive way and was unassailably cool. So one of the one of the great examples of that in my mind is the Texas Grill Frito joke. He has a joke where he talks about how Frito Lay has a, a Frito with grill marks on, it and they call it Texas Grill Fritos. And the obvious easy joke on that is like, "Oh, who's the advertising genius who came up with that?" But Mitch took it the other direction. He goes, "Hell yeah, makes me think of summertime when we used to fire up the barbecue and throw down on some Fritos." <laughs> I can still see my dad with the apron on. You better flip that Frito, Dad. You know how I like it. He could take something that could be easily turned around and negative and just makes it so funny and positive. And that was, to me, what made him so amazing. People can write one-liner jokes, but not everybody can do it with the style and amazing perspective and personality that Mitch did. This joke is so stupid. I went to a doctor and all he did was suck my blood. I went to a doctor. All he did was suck blood from my neck. Don't go see Dr. Acula. <laughs> it's so stupid. And it's so hilarious at the same time. And the whole like knocking on the door, go around. That basically was about Nick DiPaolo. He had a joke about the neighbor banging on the wall when he was playing his music too loud. And whenever he would knock on my wall, I knew he wanted me to turn my music down. And that made me angry because I like loud music. So when he knocked on the wall, I'd mess with his head. I'd say, go around. I cannot open the wall. I don't know if you have a doorknob on the other side. Over here, there's nothing. It's just flat. That was Nick DiPaolo, and that was his neighbor banging on the wall. My fiance at the time was traveling, and she was on an escalator, and some guy tried to pick her up by using the... I like an escalator, because an escalator can never break. It can only become stairs. <laughs> You would never see an escalator temporarily out of order sign. Just escalator temporarily stairs. <laughs> Sorry for the convenience. She called him on. It's like, oh, that's a Mitch Hedberg joke, huh? Because he was trying to pass it off as his own. And she totally busted him, and it just warmed my heart. But you still hear people quoting Mitch to this day, and those records still, not as much, but they still continue to sell, and they, those records still continue to spin on radio and digital. So he has a lasting legacy because that stuff just holds up. And it's not just about the jokes. It's about who he was as a person, how he delivered it and his perspective. And I think unlike a lot of comics who burn bright and burn out, he's, his stuff is going to be relevant for a long, long time. Hedberg is just a comedian that will forever be quoted and forever loved because his ideas are so silly, simple and pure and brilliant. 
There was a real genius behind his twist of ideas. The craftsmanship of writing a joke. Now a lot of people go in there in story forms and a lot of young comedians meander verbally. But like just that brilliantly written joke and a twist of the idea. There's a real art to that. People will enjoy his comedy for a long, long time. And then a bunch of people will be able to go back and steal it. You went to a club. You knew every night there was going to be one Mitch Hedberg ripoff person, which is not great, but it's kind of flattering in a way that that is the mark that you left on society. Everyone who worked with Hedberg or just spent a minute hanging around listening to Hedberg CDs talked like Hedberg. You can't stop it. There's certain comics that people emulate, not linguistically, but verbally. Like Brian Regan, you hear a lot of Brian Regans and hear a lot of David Tells. And I imagine there's quite a few Hedberg influenced people. It just happens when someone is good and, and has a, literally a unique voice. Not just his comic voice, but his actual voice. You could definitely see the influence on the next generation or two of comics because I used to go around and you'd be like, who's this guy? He sounds exactly like Hedberg. And you would immediately like cross your arms like, what does he think he's going to do? Be Hedberg? No one can be Hedberg. I, I sounded like Dice Clay when I started by trying to not sound like Dice Clay. I just sounded like some weird guy that didn't have a quite an accent. It was me fighting Dice Clay out of my voice, but it still wasn't my own voice. Sometimes you cheat other people. But yeah, Hedberg had an era where everyone was trying to be Hedberg. And that's a beautiful thing, as long as you grow out of it. You can see that he affected all of this group of young comics, that like everybody grew up listening to him back then, for sure, and that they all kind of sounded like him. They were trying to be as mysterious as him and everything, and it just didn't work, in my mind, because I saw the original, and the original, there was nothing better than that. The fact that he was so clever and one of a kind and wasn't there to please people, but was there to speak his truth through the kind of style that he had. I think that every comic dreams to be that clever, that one of a kind, and also that authentic and silly enough and fun enough to play when you're on stage, to laugh at your own stuff, to be in the moment. He was really unique and specific point of view. And, and I think that that would have carried him through to greater success. There is the cult of Mitch Hedberg, it seems. And they're the ones who are, you know, will tweet at me about how can I see Los Angelatos? They're into the deep cuts of his career. But yeah, he did have a rabid fan base. And I think he just got it off of, you know, it was good that he got it off of just his jokes, really. His jokes have endured and reached all over the world. I've traveled all over the world. I've heard people talking about him in Mongolia, New Zealand, and everywhere. People of every age, kids, old people. Hedberg's jokes are great for everybody. It's like the Beatles. He's timeless. The rock star comic. Jim Morrison, in a way, and Kurt Cobain. He definitely got in this audience at this point. And they loved him, like loved him, loved him more than... I work with a lot of comics and I notice a lot of interaction between the fans and the act. And that connection that he had with his fans was special when I saw it. And it honestly was a lot bigger than anyone thought. The Punchline San Francisco, which is our primary club, and out of these comic cards, who do you want to see? And it became Mitch Hedberg, Mitch Hedberg, Mitch Hedberg. And then even after he died, there was always wish Mitch, you know, you could see it. It was like that. It would be interesting to see how many specials on Netflix he would have had now or if somebody would have figured out how to harness his brand of comedy in something other than stand-up. I think had he survived and kept going, he would have been an arena act. He was well on his way. He was going to be that guy. So he didn't get to be that guy, but people for years, you go online if you look at YouTube videos and stuff, I mean, there's still current comments coming in. And it's still three days ago, so-and-so, Mitch was the greatest of all time. There was a lot of people that really thought that he was the greatest. I think there'll never be another Mitch Hedberg. That style of the one-liners and the randomness to it and just the charm and the innocence of it, 
like I said, his jokes are really universal. And they play all over the world. There was really a sweet, beautiful soul behind all that stuff. And he was one of the funnest guys to hang out with. He just had a beautiful brain. He was just always thinking on a different level. His jokes will last forever. One time I had a Jack of Coke that had a lime in it, and I saw that the lime was floating. That's good news, man. Next time I'm on a boat and it capsizes, I will reach for a lime. I'll be water skiing without a life preserver on. People will say, what the hell? And I'll pull out a lime. <laughs> and a lemon, too. I'm saved by the buoyancy of citrus. <laughs> I thought my teeth were white until I washed my face with Noxzema. <laughs> they are off-white. <laughs> I'm not even white. I'm off-white. It's a new race. We will prevail. You know, when it comes to racism, people say, I don't care if they're black, white, purple, or green. Oh, hold on now. Purple or green? You gotta draw the line somewhere. <laughs> to hell with purple people. <laughs> Unless they're suffocating. <laughs> then help them. Hope on Top, an oral history of Mitch Hedberg is hosted and produced by Julie Sebaugh with executive producer Jack Vaughn, associate producer Brian Hennigan, production assistant Bruce Hamilton, edited by Daniel Spaventa, engineered by Daniel Spaventa and Andrew Gruss, with contributors Doug Stanhope, Greg Chaley, Zoe Friedman, Eddie Brill, Jack Vaughn, Jeff Wills, David Tell, Todd Berry, and Tom Rhodes. Hedberg's albums are available from Comedy Central Records.